Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our first live stream edition of Historia SG at the National Museum of Singapore. Our apologies for the slight delay in starting, um, while we resolve some technical issues. For those of you who are not familiar with Historia SG, this lecture series invites academics and researchers to present on important but lesser known aspects of Singapore's history, culture, and heritage. Today, we are honoured to have with us Dr. Imran Lin Tajuddin, who researches architectural encounters in maritime Southeast Asia across the long durée and examines the vernacular city and its heritage tropes. He is Mutawa Visiting Fellow in Oxus and is currently Visiting Senior Fellow at the NUS Department of Malay Studies. Today, Dr. Tajuddin will be discussing the complex legacies of Kampong Malacca and Kampong Bengkulu, two forgotten neighbourhoods of early communities in colonial Singapore. Through the micro-histories of these two places, he will reconsider the conventional narratives and framing of the colonial city, particularly our present assumptions about the Jackson Plan. Um, throughout the presentation, you are invited to submit your questions for our Q&A session later on via the link below. Um, it should be in the Facebook post if you are watching on Facebook. Uh, but we, re we recommend that you watch from the link so that you can submit your questions at the same time. With us today, we also have Daniel Tham, the Curatorial Lead at the National Museum of Singapore, who will be moderating the Q&A session today. Daniel has been with the National Museum since 2010 and had most recently curated the special exhibition An Old New World from the East Indies to the founding of Singapore. So feel free to keep your questions coming during the presentation so we can have a fruitful discussion later on. And without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Tajuddin to give his presentation. So Dr. Tajuddin, please. Okay, um, good evening. Uh, thank you, Hui Chi, uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, let me begin immediately on my uh, lecture for tonight. And uh, I thank all of you also for joining me and uh, Daniel for uh, hosting the Q&A later. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, this topic that I have called the complex legacies of Kampung Laka and Kampung Bengkulu. These are two uh, urban neighbourhoods in Singapore. Uh, their names, I think, uh, are not familiar to most of us. I mean, we have to mention where is Kampung Bengkulu. It's like, what is Kampung Bengkulu? Where is that? Uh, and Kampung Malacca, maybe some people might know because of the association with the name uh, of a mosque. It's a place qualifier for the name of a historical mosque. In fact, regarded as the first known registered mosque of colonial Singapore. So, uh, so much for the names themselves. But what about their locations? So if I told you Bengkulu is simply the uh, name, in Malay of course, of uh, Bengkulen. Bengkulen is the anglicised version of Bengkulu. Then you might, oh yeah, I know Bengkulen Street. So indeed, uh, Kampung Bengkulu is in the vicinity of uh, Bengkulen Street. Uh, and that's, that's uh, in, in, on the map that I am showing you, you, you see uh, areas shaded red with question marks marking them. So these are areas that are excluded from the... Um, Areas, uh, uh, the conservation districts that are given um, ethnic labels or racial labels. Uh, you have Little India, you have Kampung Glam, uh, you have Chinatown, and then you have other areas that don't have a racial label, but uh, they are celebrated for, um, let's put it this way, non-ethnic or non-cultural, not, something not related to people's origins. You know? So Singapore River is not celebrated for any particular group, for example. So actually, ironically, I, I would be in favour of the latter way of looking at place histories, which is not to racialize a place, but to look at it in its diverse uh, manifestations across different communities who live in the same area. And so when we are looking at Kampung Malacca and Kampung Bengkulu tonight, uh, we're going to look, try and look at that uh, and look at just how many different groups interacted um, in, in the... Uh, kind of a very fine grain manner uh, down to the level of the street and even to the level of individual units changing hands and also how people live next door to each other uh, in the city. So uh, we are now going to uh, look at uh, how the, the rest of the talk is divided into uh, five uh, sections. Um, so we're going to look at first the uh, early communities for which uh, these uh, neighbourhoods were named. Why is it called Kampung Malacca? You know, why is it called Kampung Bengkulu? And uh, what are the foundational features, the, 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 the landmark, the urban landmark that marks uh, this, these early communities? Uh, and where they are located, you know, in the larger scheme of things, both before and after the colonial town plan uh, of uh, 1822, early 23, 1823, uh, which is popularly known as uh, Jackson Plan, or the 
plan of Singapore Town by Lieutenant uh, Jackson, Philip Jackson. So um, that's number one. And then uh, part two, we're going to look at uh, very quickly, just, uh, just to give us a sense of the chronology of the key uh, socioeconomic trans transformations by just looking at uh, landmarks connected with uh, religious institutions in particular. And then after that, we're going to look at, in section three, uh, some, uh, it's, it's, section three, I, I, I would like to qualify, uh, is very much a, an empirically, uh, um, conf in a way, it's quite confusing. It's an empirically driven section where we look at specific building drawings and try and tease out some narratives out of it. Uh, the narratives are not yet fixed. Um, we are still, there's a team of us looking at it. Uh, and it's really very complex, and sometimes you can't force a narrative out of something. So I just want to share this in section three. And in section four, we look at some forgotten institutions and what I would like to call curious incidents that uh, really tell us you know, the very um, ov much overlooked uh, complex histories that we find in these two areas. And finally, just a kind of uh, a wrap up, if you like, uh, addressing what I would like to call the missing pages of our urban history. Um, I call them missing pages because as we saw in the earlier slide, uh, the areas shaded red, they're not, um, they're not framed uh, whether physically or in terms of how we are taught uh, urban cultural and social history in, uh, in, in the standard narratives. Uh, they're not presented as places where uh, we talk about Singapore identities composition. So we tend to have the what I wrote at the top of this slide, CMIO, right? Chinese, Malay, Indian, others. And so certain groups are completely left out. And as we shall see from looking at Kampung Melaka and Kampung Bukulu, we, there's also a way to reframe. Uh, so now we are kind of gliding into section one, uh, reframe. Uh, how we imagine early Singapore to have been like in terms of how uh, people were organized spatially and how they grouped together in neighborhoods. So we tend to think that, uh, and again, we fall back on this Jackson plan, right? We tend to think, oh, you know, Raffles, the, the, you know, he, he knew that uh, different people, uh, he even said this, you know, that, uh, you know, it's better to keep, group them according to their groups and subgroups even, because otherwise they'd quarrel and there's no way they're going to coexist peacefully, you know, so they, they have to be kept apart. But actually, actually, if you really, really looked at the fine grain, that was never the case from the very beginning and not even with the implementation, the partial implementation of the Jackson Plan. More importantly, I want to talk about the inter-ethnic uh, linkages, sometimes through the language of Malay, which was the trade and diplomatic lingua franca of that time, not just trade, but link, uh, diplomatic as well. So it was written, you know, missives were written in Malay. Um, uh, but also beyond the Malay language, uh, the shared forms related back to Malay usages that were transliterated, that means the sound is translated, or uh, translated in terms of the meaning. So we are looking a few, at a few here, and basically we are focusing on uh, tonight's topic at hand, which is Kampung Bengkulu. Kampung Serani is a section of the overall Kampung Bengkulu. Uh, it never appears in maps, but we know it exists as such uh, through both Malay as well as, in this case, Hokkien and Cantonese usage. Right? So we've got Sekiani, uh, which is the rendition or the transliteration of the Malaytam Serani, which is re a reference to the Portuguese Eurasians and Eurasians in general. So Manila Street and Queen Street were called Kampung Serani in Malay, and Sekiani Kai, uh, or Serani Street, right? uh, in these two languages. Uh, Kampung Bengkulu, uh, likewise, you know, that's uh, the name in Malay for Albert Street and a whole host of other streets which are not listed here, including, of course, Bengkulun Street itself. And uh, guess what? If you listen to uh, Hokkien and uh, Teochew and uh, Cantonese, it's a transliteration. In this case, it's Kampong Mangkulu. The Mangkulu, of course, is a transliteration of the Bengkulun name. right? And even Kampong, which is the uh, Hokkien pronunciation for Kampong. Uh, it is Cantonese that is able to say Kampong with a P. So in Hokkien, it became Kampong. Uh, but, but everybody understood that refers to Kampung, uh, and so on. And so, so for Kampung Malaka, you have a more extensive list here, all referencing Kampung Malaka, including Hong Lim Ki. You would have expected, as I mentioned in earlier lectures a few years back, uh, that the name Hong Lim to the Ki would have meant that the Chinese would have referred to it as a Hong Lim Ki as well. But no, they actually called it Kampung Malaka's uh, high key, you know, rather than uh, Hong Lim something. But uh, so you've got that kind of... Uh, shared names, we also have names noted in the colonial survey maps and by surveyors for colonial mapping. So we've got two examples. There are so many examples uh, that we can look at, you know. 
Uh, here I show you 1842. The labels are there. Kampung. I know it's a bit unclear, but if you are able to look at the original 1842 map, the one on the left, you would be able to see Kampung Bengkulu written there with a C. Kampung Bengkulu. You would be able to see Kampung Glam. So Kampung Glam, as both uh, maps, both maps attest, used to be the area. The, it's a geographic area. It's not a racialized area. You don't say Kampung Glam is the Muslim Malay area. No. It was a geographic neighborhood of Singapore, all the way from Bras Basa, right after Raffles Institution, which is today Raffles City, all the way up to the mouth of Rocha River, which is Crawford Street. So, in fact, the entire area was called Kampong Glam Plain. It's not in reference to any uh, ethnic group, religious group, or whatever. Uh, likewise, Kampong Bengkulen. Likewise, Kampong Saigon. Well, Kamp you see, and then, so here I have to qualify. A name like Kampong Saigon, a name like Kampong Dobi, a name like Kampong. Uh, Java. So these are not so much racialized or race references. They are references to places of origin. So people from Saigon could have been Chinese, for example, right? uh, rather than um, Vietnamese, for example. Yeah? Uh, uh, Dobi is a particular occupation. You'd be surprised there are two Kampong Dobis in Singapore. Uh, one of them, uh, the Dobi uh, shop, is actually operated by a Chinese person, and it's in uh, our Kampong Pengkulu. Yeah? So these are examples where names are noted in colonial service. And finally, I want to point out how this completely differs from how we usually use the reference point of race to understand the city. Why do I say that? We keep referring to how uh, you know, there's the Bugis Kampong, Arab Kampong, European Town, Chulia Kampong, and Chinese Kampong. But guess what? The names in blue that I've written there, those are the actual names used in Malay, in Hokkien, in Cantonese, and in Tamil. I didn't show you how it was transliterated into Tamil, but Tamil also, for example, Kampong Dobi, guess what? It was called Dobi Kampam. Kampam is the Tamil rendition of Kampung, Dobi Kampam, for Dobi God. Just, just imagine that. So these were names that were shared, and they didn't always refer to ethnicity. They referred to occupation, place of origin, and so on. They transcended ethnicity, uh, and they uh, sometimes are more specific than just race. Yeah. And um, lastly, just by way of introduction, this term Kampung is also used interchangeably with the word town. So if the Jackson Plan calls... Uh, the area of uh, um, beyond Jalan Sultan, Bugis Kampong, this 1825 survey calls it Bugis Town, not Bugis Kampong. But you also have Kampong Glam and then Kampong China, as opposed to uh, Chinese, Chinese Town in the 1822 map that you see on the left here. So these terms using the, 1820, the map published in 1825 that I'm sharing here were used interchangeably. You also have the term village, so it coexists, right? You guys, Bugis Village, Bugis Town, you have Kampong Glam, Kampong China, and then on another map, you have Chinese Town and so on. So it was an interchangeable, interchangeably used term, and the term Kampong referred as much to an urban neighbourhood as it, as it did also refer to uh, rural uh, settlements. So having cleared all of that, we are now ready to look at Kampong Malacca. If we look at the 1843 survey map by J.T. Thompson, you notice it's sprawled across in block letters, italicized, this name Kampong Malacca, right? Now, where is that, you wonder? Actually, it's in the vicinity of what is today, um, well, it's, it's the MRT called Clark Key, right? Or you will hear it in Mandarin, Kelama. Well, actually, people didn't call it Kelama. In the, in the past, they called it Kampong Malacca, right? Kampong Malacca. So maybe we should change the way we call that area, no? No, no it's not... What was it? Kelama, you know? It's not that. It's not that at all. It's so artificial. Why are we inventing these artificial names? It was Kampung Malacca even to the Hokkien and Cantonese speakers. Now, what's so special about Kampung Malacca, you might ask? In this map, in the survey map, the earliest, the earliest known mosque of Singapore, Masjid Omar Kampung Malacca or Omar Mosque of Kampung Malacca, is already indicated. I know it's a little bit faint, unfortunately. If you are able to obtain the original map and look at it closely, you'll be able to find, can you see the orange square there? between the letters N and G. That's the location, it's, cor it's correct, uh, that's the location of <coughs> Kampung Malacca uh, Mosque, which is Omar Mosque, right? And the street leading up to it was later called Mosque Street. Um, and the street leading perpendicular to it is later on called Omar Road. Now what happened at that time is if you look back at the uh, Jackson Plan, right, the idea at that time was to allocate that area, which is later Kampung Malacca, as Chulia Kampung. So what happened instead was uh, it didn't become a racialized Chulia settlement. It became instead a place associated with all the Malaccans. Many of the Chulias did indeed migrate via Malacca. Now, who? And in fact, many of them didn't identify themselves as Chulia. They identified themselves as what is called Jawi Pekan or Jawi Peranakan. Uh, the most famous example of a Jawi Pekan or Jawi Peranakan is Munshi Abdullah. He was of Tamil and Arab descent. 
He spoke Malay. He taught Malay as well as, well as being able to teach Hindi and Arabic. He considered himself Malay, but a Jawi Peranakan Malay. And he was from Malacca. He lived for a while in Kampung Malacca. So this is actually, you know, it's not... Did he regard himself as Chilean? No. And guess who endowed the mosque at Kampung Malacca? It was an Arab, not from Arabia, but who came via Palembang, a port town in southeast Sumatra, a more important port town in the past than Singapore was, which was, of course, totally eclipsed by the rise of Singapore. So, you know, somebody like Said Omar, Aljunid, he's an Aljunid, um, lived in a milieu where uh, he, con he also would have deemed himself, of course, firstly Arab, uh, but also, in a way, Malayized Arab, in other words, a Jawi Peranakan or Jawi Pekan situation. So that's, that's um, from the morphology to the socio-morphology, if you like, of this area. Right? The fact that it was already uh, surveyed and marked. But uh, as, you, as you can see, the streets were not yet made. So at that time, the settlement grew by itself without the uh, municipal council having intervened in uh, laying out the roads. Right? So it was a settlement before it was regularized. So the next time we see it, as in this map, uh, which is the 1878 map, uh, you find that the area of Kampung Malacca has been regularized and the, that's Mosque Street right there, a very short stretch of perpendicular street to the rest. And the mosque is not indicated, but we know it's there, of course. The earlier mosque, uh, the earlier map showed it. Now, you will notice if your eyes are very sharp, there's a mosque indicated slightly further up. Well, now, where is that? I'll come back to that later. That's one of the little things that we'll be talking about that has not ever been discussed in Singapore urban history before that I will present tonight. But you also notice a whole plethora of other names, Kampung Saigon. Here's Kampung Bengkulu. So I'm showing this partly to introduce you to where Kampung Bengkulu is on the map. I'm not lying. It's called Kampung Bengkulu. Uh, Bengkulen in this case, spelled Bengkulen, uh, alongside other places like Kampung Kapo and so on. The area I highlighted in yellow at the top, that's the Bengkulenese Malay burial ground, which we will see again later. So the Bengkulen Malays, now how come we have Bengkulen Malays? We can understand why we had the Malacca Malays. Malacca Malays are associated, of course, the migration of people from uh, Malacca is associated with Farqa's uh, attempt to populate Singapore, right? It, had a, it needed more people, it needed people to uh, grow food, to send food, to, you know, and so on. Malacca Malays were the ones who provided fish, they built the stakes, they knew how to build uh, Kelong. What we understand as Kelong, they, they built it in, in, in early Singapore. Um, and they were also the ones to uh, sell chicken, uh, uh, fowl and so on. And then the Bengkulen Malays, on the other hand, along with uh, those uh, sepoys from India, uh, were part of the contingent that Raffles brought over you know, for the security of the new colony. So Kampung Bengkulu had that kind of association and the Bengkulan Malays had a burial ground in what is today Istana Grounds, I highlight at the top there. Now, for lack of time, I won't be able to go on to all the other interesting snippets we can uh, you know, kind of uh, take out of this map. This, you see all the place names are highlighted in yellow. Instead, we're going to jump right into Bengkulan Street's landmark. Uh, so the, 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 land, the landmark that reminds us obliquely, I would say, of the Bengkulen Malay community is Bengkulen Street, uh, Masjid Kampung Bengkulu. If you look at older Brita Harian uh, or the Malay Daily in Singapore uh, articles, they refer to it as Masjid Kampung Bengkulu. Later on, the name Bengkulu totally dropped out in the 1970s. And today, it's seen as a Tamil mosque. And it's a Tamil Hanafi mosque. So at a, some point in its history, the ownership or the trusteeship, uh, custodianship over the mosque shifted from, I'm getting a bit technical here, the Shafi'i uh, school of thought, right, uh, which is adhered to by Malays and Hadrami Arabs and some Tamils, to the Hanafi school of thought in, his, uh, in Sunni Islam. So uh, this happened around about the 1900s or maybe after the 1880s, after the death of all the initial trustees who were related to uh, Omar Aljunid and other Aljunid members of uh, the Arab, uh, Hadrami Arab uh, family in Singapore. So when they, uh, and you might re recall, oh, we are again looking at um, Omar Aljunid. So it's the same uh, family um, who uh, were involved in the establishment of uh, Kampung Malacca's mosque, Masjid Omar Kampung Malacca. So in fact, these two early settlements, their mosques were both endowed by the same family and members of the same family. But in the case of Mankulin Street, the, as, I men as I mentioned, sorry, the trusteeship passed to Hanafi adherents and uh, the community became Tamil. At, at, the point, at the earlier point in time, there were, there were also other Hanafi adherents who were not Tamil. So it, it signals to us, uh, I can't elaborate on it, but it signals to us uh, the shift in the geo, geo, um, 
uh, in the demographic uh, composition of Kampung Bengkulu across time by the 19th to by the turn of the 19th to 20th century. Uh, well, um, I'm just showing you this map uh, to to kind of uh, close this section uh, before we move on to the next section uh, on the chronology. But here is a closer look at the label South Kampung Malaka. So Kampung Malaka had a North Kampung Malaka as well in this 1893 map. That's what I'm using here. Uh, the label South Kampung Malaka and North Kampung Malaka was used. So Kampung Malaka encompassed quite a big area, both Clark Key to the north and, uh, well, the Clark Key MRT station area to the south uh, was called Kampung Malaka and differentiated as north and south. The mosque was here. If you remember that old map that we saw, this one, right? So this street is Omar Road and this is Mosque Street. So right here, that's what became Omar Road leading up here and then Mosque Street and the mosque is there. Right. So just a quick introduction. Uh, now, so that's the foundational features and uh, the early communities associated with Kampung Malaka and Kampung Bengkulu. They've, they've more or less been left out of the, the, the narrative because even the, na the names of the neighborhoods uh, are not usually um, even mentioned. Uh, the next section looks at the chronology. Now what happened? Of course today you don't associate those two areas with just the Malaka uh, multi-ethnic community or the Bengkulani, so it's much more diverse than that. And uh, I would like to put a chronological ordering to this, this kind of diversification, right? So I, I won't be able to, of course, go through each and every one of these entries. It's very complicated. Kampung Bukulu is a large area. But if you look at the, uh, the, the, the chronology here, in fact, the, the Masjid Kampung Bengkulu, which was funded by Syed Omar bin Ali al as I mentioned earlier, who lived at High Street, by the way. He didn't live at Kamp uh, Arab Kampong or Arab Street. He lived at High Street next to the Teochew merchant Xia Yu Chin, who used to have a, a Chinese courtyard, traditional Chinese courtyard house. Uh, both their houses, Syed Omar and uh, Xia Yu Chin's houses, are now beneath the Singapore Parliament house, actually. So it's beneath that, if you want to know where it used to be. So how glorious it would be if the two houses were still there, but they're not. Uh, anyway... Uh, so, the two earlier buildings than Masjid Kampung Bengkulu were in fact the Malay ch Chapel, the Malay Chapel or Greja. Greja is the Malay term for church taken from the Portuguese Igreja. Uh, Igreja. So, uh, Greja here refers to church of, the, of Keysbury, Reverend Keysbury from the London Missionary Society, uh, 1843. So, it's actually older than the mosque of Kampung Bengkulu. Why, you might ask, because if you recall, that area which is Kampung Bengkulu, how it panned out as Kampung Bengkulu, was initially intended for European town. So it's little surprise that the earliest two worship houses in the area is the Catholic Church at Bras Basa. Now, where exactly are these? So the Catholic Chapel at Bras Basa is this. Now, the Catholic Chapel here is the predecessor of the churches of St. Peter's and St. Paul and of St. Joseph's. So actually, initially it was here before it became uh, St. So St. Joseph's Church was not built yet, neither was uh, St. Peter's and Paul's. And so on. So I, I could elaborate. This is a very complicated, actually, the story of churches in the area, because it was intended as European town, is a very complex one. Uh, I won't be able to elaborate it for tonight. But suffice to list it out so that you can see. Now, besides the first three earliest surviving uh, places of worship, including the very important Portuguese Mission Church or St. Joseph's Church, after which, you know, Kampung Serani is, the, uh, is, is uh, kind of uh, anchored, Upon, uh, you have other places like the Bethesda Chapel at Basa, uh, which is no longer there. It has moved, uh, which initially began as a mission room at Bengkulen Street and so on. Mr. Krishnan Temple alongside the Kwan Im Tong Temple at Waterloo Street. And so, so you can see how diversified it became. There was even the synagogue, uh, which uh, at Waterloo Street is seen as the oldest surviving in not just Singapore, but also Southeast Asia. Uh, and finally, you know, these two uh, uh, places of worship, which began as a Sindhi residence. Sindhis are people from northeastern India, uh, donated as a Hindu and a Sikh temple, and then later became the central Sikh temple, the predecessor of today's central Sikh temple near Bunking MRT station. So, in fact, Kampung Bengkulu is quite formative, yeah, you might realize, uh, and Masjid Bengali, which we will come back to later. Uh, the Bengali there is a bit of, a, of a, an interesting misnomer. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to why I say that. But uh, here, back to this map showing you uh, the locations of some of these, as well as this is a bit technical. In 1843, as well as in 1879, those of you who are interested in street names, you know, you might notice Saligi, uh, Short and Flint was renamed Princep, Church was renamed Waterloo, 
This has these two, the next two have not been noted in any of the toponymics books, neither the book by Savage and uh, Yo nor uh, the more recent book uh, on uh, street names in Singapore. So actually what happened, this is very curious, was that uh, initially called Rocho Street and then called Marlborough Street and then finally called Victoria Street. That's how it's always narrated. But what was not mentioned is that Victoria and Queen Street actually switched positions. How confusing is that? So the main road that you today call Victoria Street was called Queen Street, and Queen Street was called Victoria Street. So it switched positions at some point in time, which has not been noted uh, in, in, in any of the publications on toponymics or street names. So two maps attest to this, unless the maps are wrong. Yeah? So uh, Queen Street and... Uh, so, so, as I mentioned, this is getting a bit technical, but uh, nevertheless, from the morphological history point of view, whole books are written on just street names, so I thought I'll point it out. Um, now, um, in terms of the chronology at Kampung Melaka, we now shift from Kampung Bengkulu. Uh, there are fewer things that I, I can uh, point out right now at this stage of our research, but I would like to point out that, um, indeed, uh, as far as we know, Masjid Omar Kampung Melaka is the earliest house of worship at Kampung Melaka, followed, uh, probably there would have been other places of worship, uh, but what we know right now is the Tan Si Chong Si, which is surviving, the so-called Tan Clan Temple, uh, is still there. And it was established in about 1885, uh, sorry, 1876, and rebuilt in 1885. And these are also Malaccans, right? They are by the Tans of Malacca, different Tan families from Malacca. So in fact, Kampung Malacca is not just uh, Malacca Malays or Malacca Jawi Peranakans who are Muslim, but also uh, Malacca Chinese, and hence uh, this, this multi-ethnic uh, composition, as I mentioned earlier, and a reference to place of origin rather than race. But I also want to point out the Pearls Hill Road Chulia Mosque. Remember, Kampung Chulia was supposed to be at where Kampung Malacca is, but it got shifted, and so uh, by the time we uh, look at the vicinity or the area in the periphery of what is understood as Kampung Malacca, we find a Pearls Hill Road, Chulia Moss, which also has not been uh, noted in any publication. Its image is there, but it's often uh, mislabeled or misunderstood as a temple, a Hindu temple. Now, of interest, and I just want to mention quickly, in Kampung Malacca, we are hoping to come to this uh, in the next uh, few months of our research, are the numerous Chinese theatre halls of Kampung Malacca. There were several, uh, and uh, th th there seemed to be an interesting concentration in the Kampung Melaka area, including a now expunged Wayang Street. Now it's the name Wayang Street is absorbed into Yutongsen Street, if I recall, or was it not uh, New Bridge Road? It's absorbed into the name of the Trunk Road, where one section of it used to be called Wayang Street. So, so much for chronology. Now, I, I gave that chronological order to allow you to understand kind of, um, okay, how did it become from Kampung Malaka to Kampung and Kampung Bengkulu to something so diverse? Today, it's no longer just Malaccans or just Bengkulu Malays. Uh, it's much more diverse than that. So, I hope that gave you a, a, a kind of a quick overview. And so now we go into the section that, that starts looking at uh, architectural features and their clues. So, if we kind of recap, um, Earlier, my earlier explanations on the multifarious uh, uh, meanings, you know, and uses behind the term kampung as a root word. From kampung, we get, you know, the English spelling as well as just the general usage in colonial maps and town plans for urban neighborhood, right, kampung. Um, you also have, from the term kampung, in, in my previous lectures, I showed the etymological uh, origin from dictionaries. I, I, I'm not showing it to you tonight. Uh, but you can refer to those earlier slides, or you can refer to a good dictionary of etymological explanation. So the term compound, the second meaning of the term compound in English refers to um, morphological entity, uh, as opposed to the first meaning, which is a chemical compound. It's entirely different. So the second meaning of the English term compound comes from the Malay word kampung, via usage in Portuguese and Dutch uh, colonial urbanism. And so you find, for example, so Song Ong Siang, in his 100 years history of the Chinese in Singapore, using the term compound house. He doesn't use, I don't know, colonial bungalow or some of those other terms. He uses the term specifically compound house. And indeed, many building drawing plans also use the term compound house. And what does a compound house look like? Well, it exists in a compound, obviously. And uh, sometimes it's surrounded because of la urban, urban land pressure, uh, surrounded by shop houses, as you can see in this aerial view of an example from Penang. So it's not just found in Singapore, but also other places. And the compound house is usually two stories. Uh, the upper story is considered the main living area, and the lower ground is considered the ancillary uh, area, because that's in the Malay form of the raised floor house, 
uh, not really living space, it's like extra undercroft space. So there's an, there's an interesting evolution that you can trace in many building plans of uh, raised floor uh, Malay houses uh, as the prototype for these uh, two-storey uh, compound houses with an infill of the ground floor to create habitable space. Sometimes the house makes very specific architectural reference to this kind of an idea of an, a kolong or undercroft. Look at this compound house of Nchik Kasim from 1891 at 129 Queen Street, which is within um, Kampung Serani slash Kampung Bengkulu. The architect is Lao Chi Hien, eh? so the architect can be Chinese. But what you see here is that the house is treated such that the ground floor has these arches, you know, which recall kind of a raised floor uh, building, Well, the upper floor uh, is treated differently. Yeah? Um, and uh, the plan, if you look at, uh, I, I gave a reference here, Jacques Dumasse, writing in 1987, talks about what he calls the Malay plan, where there is a suite, a suite of rooms, um, pairs of rooms arranged along a central corridor, the lorong, from a front and rear uh, hall or veranda, which you see here, right? a front and a rear, and then a, a suite of rooms, uh, pairs uh, flanking a central corridor. So that's the most basic form of what he calls the Malay plan. This is, of course, I'm, I'm citing Jacques Dumasse. Um, what does the compound house look like in coexistence with uh, shop houses? So you can still find a few examples along, uh, in this case, this is, these are all Waterloo Street, right? Some of you might be familiar with these buildings. Centre 42 is right there in blue there. Uh, that's the uh, synagogue uh, of Waterloo Street, which again uh, is uh, following the compound house topology uh, with this uh, projecting front. It's often called Palladian, uh, but it's a rather curious thing to say because Palladian houses don't exactly have this projecting vestibule like that. And there is no proper name for it in English. In Malay, there are names for it, Surong and Anjong. So there seem to be there seems to have been a kind of adaptation and a transformation of what was obviously, evidently, initially a, a very um, Anglo type to something that was, in, in a sense, adapted to uh, Malay usages and understandings of space, including the internal subdivisions. Coming back to the idea of compounds, if you uh, look at the area of uh, Kampung Bengkulu, and, uh, or, or what was intended as European town, you would realise that the, the large compounds uh, at the centre of each of these compounds was supposed to have been one particular house. So actually, if I were to go all the way back to an earlier plan such as this, yes, if we were to go, to, go back to sorry, this one, you might be able to see yeah, uh, these subdivisions into compounds and then a little black square inside. So that's the subdivision into compounds. Now, if we were to enlarge that, that would look like this. It's somewhat like what you see in the aerial view from Penang that I mentioned earlier, but you've got uh, this example here that I shaded in orange at the corner of Princip Street and Middle Road. Uh, that was originally the plot of one compound house that was then subdivided like that into several shop houses. So we see this process taking place. Sometimes even within a compound, uh, there would be subdivisions that use the typological uh, formal uh, the formal typological features of shop houses to create ancillary buildings or outhouses. In this case, we are looking at Greja Keysbury or the Malay Chapel. Chapel. It's interesting, it was called the Malay Chapel because the, the hope of the London Missionary Society was to convert Malays. Uh, but what happened instead was it became uh, quite uh, a centre, an important centre uh, for the straight Chinese or Chinese Peranakan uh, uh, community, right, Presbyterian. So we have, for example, uh, Song Ong Siang again and uh, his father affiliated to this, as well as, we'll come to this later, Bengkulen Chinese Pranakans also affiliated to this church. I'll come to this at the end of this section. Right? But uh, here's an example that we can also look at in terms of the typological history as much as the social and, in this case, uh, religious institutional history. Uh, next door, I mean, uh, not next door, but along the same street, um, you can find other examples of morphological change, uh, a vacant plot that was subsequently used for shop houses, which are of interest to us from the point of view of uh, this uh, special feature that you can still find in some examples in Singapore where the shop house uh, is somewhat, you, you can argue, is somewhat like a multi-storied version of a Chinese courtyard house with its layers of roofed spaces. So you can notice the first front section of this house here uh, has a miniature roof, right, uh, with a Chinese gable. I can't make out 
what it looks it looks like a, a it looks somewhat like a fire gable from what I can see here, uh, but its its miniature version is not often found in other shop houses. Right, usually it just slopes down. So here's an example which tries to uh, signify a kind of threshold front space. Although in this case that threshold front space is in fact up in the air, it's on the third floor. Yeah. Um, other examples, perhaps uh, in the interest of time, I won't elaborate on this. But here um, uh, is, is a house of uh, is in out, an outhouse that takes after a, uh, a pedimented. It's just an outhouse actually, but it has a pediment to try and um, complement the main house. This is a, a side house to a compound house. Next door, we haven't found the drawing yet. Is the house of the Cindy merchant, who later donated his residence in 1906 for uh, Sikh and Hindu temple. Yeah, so. Uh, that's a kind of diversity and uh, interesting architectural histories that you can find from spe specific examples. Um, I think uh, here, when we look at the kind of range of architectural uh, cases uh, from Kampung Bengkulu, uh, then you know the, the stories are so diverse that, um, like I said earlier, it's, it's very difficult to give a running thread overall. So instead, you have micro history street by street. After a complete survey of the entire area, then perhaps we might be able to float above it and give it some meta-narrative. But right now, what we're doing is to look at specific examples like this. A, there was a children's home, for example, uh, at the corner of Queen Street and Middle Road, uh, with its own complex histories uh, within it. And who were the agents involved, changing hands, um, uh, what was it? Uh, why, why was a children's home there? Uh, it had to do with uh, religious institutions uh, in the area and so on. But also you can see the architectural point of view uh, or the urban morphological point of view, if you like, how uh, plots are subdivided you know, uh, and the kinds of building types that develop in Singapore. So this is a little bit more technical, uh, looking at different... It's not just shop houses, actually. Yeah, it's not just shop houses. There were so many building types in Singapore that, um, uh, for and 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 in this case, uh, Kampung Bengkulu provides a really rich uh, diversity of uh, these other building types um, that that uh, we we often overlook when we only focus on shop houses as a heritage typology in Singapore. Um, I think I, I will quickly move forward in the interest of time. Uh, and just quickly mention things like the Mercantile Institute, Institution, uh, which, which uh, is important in the social history of Singapore. Uh, it was, in fact, um, in this particular set of drawings, written as private school for a particular person named P.E. Pereira. So a Eurasian person seems to have established this institution, according to this drawing. Uh, as a private school, but you find in the drawing, building drawing, Mercantile Institution. And mercantile Institution is important for, uh, for example, um, um, the poet and artist uh, who went to school there. Um, his name suddenly escapes me, but so many different uh, individuals went through uh, schooling at the Mercantile Institution uh, in Kampung Bengkulu. Yeah. Um, now, uh, looking at the same stretch, I want to also point out, maybe this is a little bit more interesting than the more technical uh, stories that I was trying to, uh, to show using those earlier drawings, uh, but you might notice here a stretch of buildings, right? They look like shop houses, uh, rows, but they seem to have a blank space in front before the street, quite prominent, and a blank space behind. These are what we can call compound shop houses. They're rather interesting in the sense that they... Uh, quite generous in terms of the setback from the street. And uh, they have a front gate as well as a yard before you get to a flight of steps. So here you can see that happening. So that's the street, Queen Street right here. It's a little, little bit small, but that's Queen Street, gate, front yard, flight of steps up. And then a front uh, kind of, um, if you like, a terrace before you actually enter the front door. So such houses, that's, that's a row, you know, such, such houses... Uh, in, in the case of Kampung Sarani, were, of course, not surprisingly, mostly the uh, uh, residences of uh, Eurasians. So actually, they're very important. Again, this is too long to go through, but I wanted to just show you the, the rich kind of uh, information you get also from oral history, uh, from, for example, the book on Singapore Eurasians, uh, the inter oral is history interviews, who, uh, from whom, yeah? from, from, from these oral interviews, uh, you get the sense of the life that goes on uh, within this uh, transformed compound, uh, compound house uh, neighborhood in Singapore. 
Uh, what I mean is that originally, Kampung Mugulu was supposed to have been dominated by compound houses. Now, because of land pressure, there was a subdivision. But the compound row house is a kind of compromise, you know. You make it almost like shop houses, so it's compact, but then you retain the sense of a compound. And indeed, when you listen to the oral history uh, interviews, uh, you get the sense of you know, having a common compound or not having a common compound, how children from different families interacted and played, how people could you know, kind of freely uh, interact, um, a social life that goes on because of uh, having a compound. Sometimes you even have the, the entire compound having a gap at the sides, really reinforcing as though this, this row of six houses was a gigantic six-dwelling uh, compound house set in a compound. So there's this rather interesting in-between. Um, unfortunately, these examples have not survived. They've all disappeared. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to point out this rather interesting in-between type. Um, maybe to, to wrap up this section um, uh, on the building types, uh, I just want to point out you know, that, 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 that uh, Kampung Bengkulu also uh, has an interesting history of businesses. Maybe you could just point out, uh, Frank, many people would know Frankel because of uh, the Frankel family, because of uh, Frankel Estate, for example. Uh, they, they operated a very large uh, furniture shop at 375 Victoria Street, which was a really huge compound house. But the compound house itself was originally built by Lee Cheng Ti, who was born in Malacca and traded with Brunei and Labuan. So you've got all these really diverse uh, histories. Now, further up, Victoria Street was another compound house of Haji Ibrahim bin Nur Muhammad who also sold furniture. So again, this multi-ethnicity. You can't pin down Kampung Bekulu's uh, race, if you like. It's, it's just so diverse. Um, you could, I could go on to talk to you about architects, R.V. Boswell and Hazamagumi. Very interesting, Hazamagumi actually had um, an advertisement in the Shonan Shimbun in, at, towards the end of the Japanese occupation, asking for 10 architectural students. You know, lodging provided, you can work for me. I'm just wondering about this story now. What does this mean? Uh, there were architects working for Jap uh, There were architectural students and architects right, working and operating during the Japanese occupation. So we, by and large, don't talk about the Jap Japanese occupation period as a period of construction. So maybe there's something here besides the Japanese temple at Makrichi Reservoir and so on. So, you know, what is this? Uh, maybe there was a, a plan for for construction which which never came to fruition because of the end of the Jap Japanese occupation. We do not know, but. I mentioned earlier Benkulun Peranakan Chinese by name Na Tian Piet. So he was born in 1836 in Benkulu, uh, and he was a, a, a voluntary uh, preacher at the Princip Street Church, right, which I told you earlier was uh, considered a Peranakan Chinese church. It never became really a Malay chapel. It became a Malay-speaking Peranakan Chinese chapel. And uh, Natian Piet was among those who were active there. He is well known in songs. One, he is noted uh, in a footnote, actually, uh, in the recent reissue of Song Ong Siang's 100 Years History of the Chinese as a writer in Malay. So he actually composed a sha'ir or a, a, a rhyme a poem uh, in 1896 for Sultan Abu Bakar of Johor. So he saw himself, you know, it really in this very bicultural sense, very literally. He took his name, Tian Piet, and called himself Kalam Langit, the translation of Tian Piet as his Malay pen name for his works. So, I mean, that, I'm just giving you this anecdote as a kind of, a, as to kind of think about the, our, our lost sense of what Singapore people were like. Yeah, this shared sense of identity that transcended race, that translated across languages, that shared certain forms and so on. Uh, you know, it, it, rather than look at it in terms of just racial categories. Speaking of um, divisions, uh, okay, maybe a little bit corny, but here's a, a, a quick look at subdivided tenements along alleys. Uh, so I'm switching from social history to something that goes back to uh, morphological history with a bit of social history. From the morphological point of view, Bengkulen, uh, Kampung Bengkulen, Right, or Kampung Bengkulu, is interesting because of the number of these small alleys uh, with all these names that I've listed uh, that, once exist, uh, that once could be found there. They were the result of the subdivision of these large compounds, right, with an alley, a blind, uh, 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 dead-end alley, subdivided on both sides into very small tenements. Um, just three examples to give you a, a kind of visual of what it, it is like, a visual sense of it. So here's one at Lorong Sepang, 
uh, this plan shows 1910 addition, so it would have, it would have been built earlier uh, by the, uh, a person named Haji Kadir. So you can see at the end of it, uh, subdivisions followed by common kitchen. So actually these are very small units um, that then had, so they are actually well ventilated in the sense that they have windows both front and back. So they have through ventilation, uh, but they shared a common kitchen because they're so tiny. So uh, it's the kind of domicile uh, that you today can only find in one surviving example, and that's Prinsip Court. So if you go along Saligi Road, you might notice to your left-hand side all the watering holes, right? Uh, and the uh, firms that occupy very small shop houses leading off from a narrow alley, and that's Prinsip Court. It was Chia Jim Chuan Place, one of several such examples. Here's a second one, uh, Lorong Sakai, 1902 edition, uh, additions in this plan. Uh, the developer was Haji Muhammad bin Abdul Rahim. So I'm pointing these examples out because you have Malays, or uh, at least uh, Indian Muslims, or Jawi Peranakans as well involved in these kinds of transactions. Some were Malay and some were Jawi Pranakan of Indian descent. Right? And then you have um, Nordin Lane, which I'm not going to elaborate on right now, but uh, Nordin Lane, the, the full story is Nordin, uh, is a Jawi Pranakan uh, in, uh, from Penang. Right? So his, he, um, they, they were in Singapore and they invested in this entire area then, uh, and other areas around Singapore. Uh, the entire name of the lane was Nordin Lane. Uh, but it's not a dead end uh, lorong, it's an, uh, uh, through a thoroughfare, as it was called in those days. Um, lorong Kranji is not a thoroughfare, it's a dead end street. But if you look at the transactions, you've got a Eurasian, uh, uh, Hadrami Arab al Habshi, and then Tan Kim Cheng buying and selling these units. Yeah. Uh, the fourth section of this talk looks at some forgotten institutions and what I call curious incidents, as I mentioned earlier. Um, one institution that is that seems to have been forgotten, although it appears in the Malay newspapers as late as the 1970s, 1974, for example, is the Queen Street Hanafi Mosque. Um, as far as I can ascertain, it was not uh, relocated. So that means there's no other Hanafi Mosque that replaced it when it was demolished uh, sometime in the late 70s. Uh, so it was at 151 Queen Street, right next to the junction with Albert Street. Um, and according to Ahmad Ibrahim in his uh, work of 1965, this was established in 1908. Uh, the name gets confused with Bengkulen because it was known as Masjid Bengali Queen Street. So sometimes, even the Malay papers in some of these years that I've noted, confuse the name Masjid Bengali Queen Street and then Masjid Bengali Kampung Benghulu in 1971, for example. But actually, they were distinct. Uh, it's, it's really you know, uh, quite uh, strange in that sense that this, these two got confused. And for the longest time, because of this confusion, uh, this Queen Street Hanafi Mosque was completely forgotten. Uh, it, it's strange to me how much of this amnesia happens in Singapore when as late as the mid-1970s, you know, it appeared in the papers, but somehow people have forgotten it. So it's rather, rather strange. Um, now, Queen Street's community uh, is Hanafi, as I mentioned, uh, and um, there's, there's something to be said here about the history of the Hanafi community. They took, they took up the custodianship of the Bengkulu Mosque, as I mentioned, and they also founded this Queen Street Hanafi Mosque. So Hanafis are a minority uh, in Singapore, right? Uh, and so there's something here about their history within Kampung Bengkulen uh, that, that you know, kind of invites uh, further work. So Abdul Udud was uh, famous for, or rather, he operated a rather, it's quite a major undertaking, a bakery uh, at number 16 Albert Street, down, up, up the street actually, from the location of the Hanafi Mosque uh, at Queen Street. So here are some drawings from his, uh, uh, from his project. Now, I mentioned earlier Pearls Hill Chulia Mosque. So this is another forgotten building. So that's the, that's the image I was talking about from the 1890s. It appears in Gretchen Liu's Singapore a Pictorial History, published in 1999, um, at, on page 138. You can look it up. But it's captioned simply, inscribed Pearls Hill Road, 1890s. And if you look in the archives, it is labelled as a temple. So actually, it's a mosque. It's the Pearls Hill Road Chulia Mosque, completely forgotten. And uh, I think I kind of know why it was. Here, here is what, in case you're a more, you know, kind of a, a map person, this is where it is on the 1893 map, so you can look it up. It's Pearls Hill uh, next to Park Road. So at that junction, right, slightly further up. So we are actually looking at it from here. If you stood here uh, beneath the letter S, 
and or rather b maybe just up before letter H, you're looking this way, you see the Chulia style gateway. If you've heard my previous talks, I talk about the Chulia miniature minarets flanking the gateway, and that's a, it's that's a sure sign of a, a Chulia Tamil uh, a mosque, right, the gateway. So here it is. It's so clear. When I first saw it many years ago in... So I first encountered it in Gretchen Liu's book. I immediately recognized it as a mosque, you know, and then I wondered how come, you know, none of the publications uh, talk about this mosque. So it's completely forgotten. And I, I think there might, I, this might have been the reason for its uh, forgetting. It seems to have been uh, bisected by the railway line that went from Tank Road Station all the way down to Tanjung Paga. You know, it goes by Duxton Hill uh, Park, right? You know, that stretch of park that used to be the rail line. Uh, so we already had a, a rail green corridor long ago, you know, in that sense. But uh, unfortunately, this rail corridor included, you know, this very violent diagonal cut across uh, Pearls Hill Road, Chulia Moss. I don't even know what the community themselves called it. So this... Pearls Hill Road, Chulia Mosque, is just my label for it. So sometime around 1907, it would have been, um, you know, flattened, diagonally cut like that. I it joke, you know, if it had survived, it would have been a triangular building, you know, on just this, just this side. I mean, you look, at, you look at how it looks like. So you, you, I know this is a mosque, not just because of the Chulia minarets, but if you looked at this map from 1878, we encountered this map earlier, you see the label mosque. I mentioned this earlier, if you were sharp, you would notice... Right, that the mosque is right there, Pearls Hill Road is right there. And by the way, this area, uh, we're not talking about it today, but Cross Street was also called Kampung Susu. There was an 18, 1951 Straits Times article in which a Chinese writer said, you know, people have forgotten it's called Kampung Susu. He said, you know, it's not just Chinatown. So, you know, this kind of forgetting is quite interesting to me. And the fact that there was a Malay school, a Tamil school, and Chinese school, uh, cheek, almost cheek by jowl in the area of uh, Cross Street. And this map also records Kampung Penghulu Kesang, something that, again, we, we, have, we have just not even scratched. Uh, Kampung Penghulu Kesang is opposite uh, Jamek Chulia Mosque and Sri Mariaman Temple at South Bridge Road, which we just today gloss as Chinatown, right? So it's, it's really quite diverse. Uh, Pearls Hill Road, one example I have found of a Marikan who are Jawi Peranakan, I'm not sure if a Jawi Peranakan were affiliated with this mosque or with uh, Kampung Melaka's Oma Mosque or both. Right? So S. Kanisa Marikan built a series of shop houses at Pearls Hill Road in 1890. Yeah. Um, and then a, th a third example of a now forgotten institution is the original Central Sikh Temple, which, or, which previously was a Hindu temple and which previously was the house of a Sindhi merchant. The Sindhis are a, a very small group in Singapore. Uh, Asomal, Wasiomal and company, for example, built uh, sh some shop houses and operated businesses at High Street. That means in the same area as Sia Yuchin and Saido Omal Junit I mentioned earlier, right? The Sindhi merchant. So Asomal, Wasiomal were also at uh, High Street. So they owned this particular DN, a, a person by name, DN Asomal, uh, later on um, endowed uh, money for this uh, Hindu temple before it later became what is understood as a central Sikh temple, which unfortunately uh, was demolished in some time after 1978. They were given notice, in, they, were, they were told in 1976, oh no, you won't be affected. In 1977, they were served notice in December. In 1978, they sent an appeal to then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, Lee, uh, Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew told them, the then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew told them, no, no, you have to go. We offer you an alternative plot. And so they left. Um, but the, 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 the Central Sikh Temple uh, at that time was built in the Straits Times articles as the oldest uh, Sikh Temple. Uh, and it has this interesting history of having been endowed by a Sindhi Hindu merchant. So I'm not sure how much of this story is still, you know, remains in the memory of people at Central Sikh Temple, but this was its earlier foundational history, and it happened within Kampung Bengkulu. Right? Um, well, some more examples, Lakman Singh, uh, in 1922, Kaniya Singh in 1926. So you know by the 1920s, it was most certainly the Central Sikh Temple. Oral history accounts tell us that it was a coexisting, uh, the, the, the both, both faiths, Hindu as well as Sikh worship, coexisted in this temple in memory of the fact that it was endowed by a Sindhi uh, Hindu merchant. Right? So some uh, images. Uh, fortunately, these are Ministry of Information and the Arts images from 1958 and 1965. I can't use Singapore press holding ones because they're so expensive and I don't know if you know, I'm even allowed to uh, show them to you. You, know, you can see them in newspapers, but you're not allowed to pluck them out. And I mean, this is, this is just being cautious. So these are MITA images from 1958 and 1965. Um, well, I think um, I, sh I probably am running out of time. So I need to uh, 
uh, to kind of uh, just skim over the next few examples, interesting though they, they are. So you've got the Futing Association, which is also a, a Hui Kuan and Kong Si. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to this image, uh, but uh, never mind. Uh, the one next to it is, is the um, proposed sanitary installation. So different projects uh, that took place um, in the 1920s at Queen Street. Um, so by the 1920s, if you understand um, the demographic changes in Singapore, um, there was another uh, rise, uh, of a dramatic increase in um, the Chinese population of Singapore in a second spurt of growth. So the first was 1890s to, uh, 1880s to 1890s. Second spurt was in the 1920s to 1930s. So uh, such developments as this reflects that um, demogra those demographic trends. Um, other institutions, again, there's no time, but uh, really, you know, I just want to point out just how uh, rich and diverse. Some of this has already been discussed, but some have never been discussed before. Uh, things like the Jewish Habonim or Youth Organization. Interestingly, it was built to teach Jewish children to grow to become, to be good citizens of Singapore. And this was, uh, this, this was pre-independence. This was the 1950s. Um, so, at, of course, at that time, nationalism was also, you know, but, but this notion of being a citizen of Singapore has to do with the fact that Singapore had become a, a city. It was uh, officially uh, uh, understood as a city. Uh, and even before that, this notion of uh, belonging to Singapore um, was also there. Uh, but the Japanese community had interesting institutions like a commercial museum at 77 Bras Basa Road. It's gone. Uh, fencing school uh, and a Japanese temple, strangely enough, in 1953, uh, the name behind the Japanese temple construction was uh, that of a Chinese person. So I haven't yet gone down to understand what was taking place there. And so on. So you've got a Sri Lanka boarding school. The Filipino community had cockfighting sessions. It's a traditional um, betting spot, actually. On Sundays at Nordin Lane, the Manila men were reported in 1896 to have lived there and organized these Sunday cockfighting sessions. Filipino musicians also lived at Nordin Lane and so on. So it's, it's extremely diverse. Uh, finally, you know, to wrap up, um, I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, um, there's, there's, there's uh, something to be said about how we, um, we omit certain uh, perspectives of uh, Singapore's social and urban uh, history, uh, partly as a corollary of the way we uh, frame its histories according to certain official designations of conservation and her ethnic heritage districts. I mean, this is something I've been talking about for years, uh, for a number of years now. Uh, but, you know, by looking at, more, more, more closely, more, more closely at the fine grain, at two examples, in this case, I've chosen Kampung Melaka and Kampung Bungkulu. I hope to, to prove the point uh, that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's so much uh, that we need to re rethink uh, about how we deal with our past uh, and how we um, discuss issues of race and um, domicile or, or inter-ethnic interactions under the colonial uh, period. So there is this tendency to talk about um, the colonial city from rather straight-jacketed and uh, mono-racial block point of view, reinforced by how we promote the tourist districts that are labelled using just one racial label. How would we do it if we... Now, you can, as I said, you know, um, be previous, uh, in previous lectures, Chinatown, Little India, ethnic labels. Kampung Glam, interestingly, is not. So if you remember the two columns, Kampung Glam comes from the label on the right. It's a non-ethnic name. It's a geographic name. Likewise, Kampung, Bengkulen, uh, Kampung Bengkulu and Kampung Malaka. Uh, how we, would we rethink and rewrite our understanding of Singapore's urban and social and communal histories if we were to start from these vantage points, you know, how, how, how do we rethink the way we present ourselves in that sense to both school children who go on tours of Little India, of Chinatown, they go to Chinatown Heritage Centre, they go to Malay Heritage Centre, and then they are told these stories from racialized points of view. How would we retell them? And how can, now the next question is, is it even possible to retell them in a place like Kampung Malaka? So I'm showing you this and this image. The yellow arrow points to the location of Oma Mosque. Now, just look at it in the initial setting with all the shop houses uh, around it and the Chinese theatre halls. And, so and today, it's completely surrounded like that. If you go to it today, it's stranded. It looks stranded and out of place. Uh, is it possible to even talk about uh, the rich histories of Singapore uh, in areas as uh, completely expunged and made over as Kampung Melaka? 
you know, there's Tansi Chong Su, which I could have also um, labelled, and uh, Masjid Omar as the only two surviving buildings. So is, is it possible? And how do we do that? Uh, is it through virtual technology, something we are developing for this project? That means you go around using an app. Does that suffice? Who would do these kinds of uh, tours? What would you, you know, is, does it enrich you to be able to wear something and uh, look at the area, not, not as it exists today, but as it used to exist? Uh, is that the way to recuperate these histories um, in a place like uh, Singapore in which we frame it in certain ways and places that offer alternative framings are no longer physically there? Uh, or in places where, um, like, like Kampung Bengkulen, you know, many institutions do still remain. Um, quite a few have uh, vanished, but many still do. But the, the residences are gone. Uh, and so, of course, it might be too nostalgic to think about how, oh, maybe we could have retained all the residences. Uh, then if you, if you see it from that pragmatic point of view, um, you know, what, what kind of uh, perspective do we gain from uh, understanding Singapore's uh, passed by looking at these uh, demolished buildings um, individually, you know, unlike uh, the, the way we cast entire neighbourhoods according to one particular um, assigned identity. So to kind of wrap up that, that little um, uh, series of questions and, and musings, I want to talk uh, at the very end here about starting from the ground up and beyond generalisations. So there is, there is, you know, kind of, I feel... Uh, quite strongly, a need to recover a sense of the immense diversity of Singapore in the past uh, through a study of the city, street by street, building by building, uh, house by house, you know, uh, going beyond um, uh, big narratives. Uh, and uh, we swim in the sea of, um, of, of multifaceted histories and micro histories and the very diverse uh, changes and transactions uh, and neighbor, uh, you know, diversity of neighbors. Uh, in both urban architectural and social history. And uh, I hope to have been able to point this out using the two expunged districts. They have been expunged almost in their entirety uh, as far as the social histories and markers of those social histories are concerned. Uh, I hope to have been able to have done so with you this evening uh, in a way uh, that lets us move beyond our present-day assumptions about where we find Singapore's uh, histories. Thank you. So I think now uh, we have the Q&A session. So Daniel, I'll be joining Daniel now. Yep. Thank you so much, Dr. Imran. Uh, please take a seat. Um, please have some water as well. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> take and catch a breather. Yes. Uh, but, but thank you so much. Uh, maybe I'll, 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 I'll just respond uh, immediately to, to what you've shared. I really appreciate it, uh, uh, your sharing today uh, as, as you talked about Kampong Malaka, Kampong Bengkulu. Uh, and as you mentioned, so important to talk about them precisely because they have been written out of history. Um, physically, of course, they, they no longer exist. And as you have uh, mentioned uh, through your talk, how, how much they are not talked about anymore, how they don't feature uh, in, in narratives of, of, of Singapore's history. And I, I, I really like how you began with the Jackson Plan. Um, obviously, that was a plan that, uh, on one hand, um, shows us that, that colonial attempt uh, to, to racialize, to, 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 to see the, the populations in discrete groups, and, and of course, to, to manage and, and to control them uh, using space. Um, and uh, I, I guess with that plan, you, you get a sense as well of how uh, Singapore has been managed through the years. It, there's, there's always this uh, attempt to, to plan and to, uh, to have very, very discreet uh, identities associated with, with each place. Um, and so what you have presented here in your talk um, is to show how from the ground up, as you have mentioned, uh, by looking at, at micro-histories, how um, very, very diverse actually the, the kinds of, of stories, uh, the kinds of, of narratives uh, that, that can emerge from there. Um, I'm just looking at one of the comments uh, from, the, from the live uh, Facebook uh, stream. Uh, Lam Sok Ching just mentions, wow, rich, diverse communities. Um, so I think it, it, it gets really exciting when you start looking individually, whether you're looking at houses mm. uh, that you can find, um, looking at individual accounts. 
um, there is such a rich diversity. And, and, and I think we can come back to, to that uh, question as, as, we, as we go through this discussion. Um, but I, I, I thought to, to, to draw on one of your comments earlier, you, you mentioned how um, as you look at the transition uh, of, uh, of these places, mm -hmm. of, of Kampung Malaka, mm -hmm. Kampung Bengkulu, you see an increasing diversity uh, springing up. And, and, and this is something that's, that's really organic, isn't it? Um, so on one hand, you have this colonial structure, um, you have very fixed ideas on how things should be, but, but on, on the ground, things are actually quite different. Um, and, and I really like uh, how, that, how that comes out. I'm, I'm very curious about the, the very early origins of, of Kampong Malaka and Kampong Bengkulu. Uh, and and uh, I, I mean, you, you mentioned how they, they link to, uh, of course, the, the early, uh, early settlers and, and, and immigrants from uh, uh, Bengkulu and from Malacca, uh, the connection with Raffles and Farka, of, of, of course. Um, how diverse were those early settlers? Uh, how much do we know about them? Mm. And, uh, and I'm, I'm curious because, again, the, these, these uh, kampongs are, are identified by where these people come from, not necessarily their ethnicity um, and, and so on. So, so what do we know about these communities from the very start? Okay. Thank you for this question because it gives me an opening to elaborate on something I stated but did not speak about in the earlier slides, the early origins as you, as you mentioned. right? Yeah. Um, for Kampung Malaka, um, there was a June 1819 uh, instruction mm. by Raffles uh, for all the Malays and Chinese who were on the northern bank around Kampung Temenggong, mm. which is today ACM, you know. Mm. All of them were to move to the south bank. All of them, because the North Bank was supposed to be civic district, right? For government buildings, right? He didn't call it civic district, but uh, yeah. But um, the Chinese, he said, the instruction was there is a bridge, you know, the bridge of North and South Bridge Road, of course. Uh, the Chinese are to settle from the mouth of the river up to the bridge. The Malays, please move beyond the bridge. So that already signals to us an early attempt to move the Malays who who were not attached to the Temenggong, because if you were attached to the Temenggong, you would definitely would not have moved. So the one among the earliest groups of Malays to have come were of course those induced by Fakwa. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that seems to have been one reason why the Malays from that area, when they later on reluctantly moved, they seem to have relocated to the area of Kampung Malaka, which was just after the bridge. You might notice that, right? it's mm -hmm. just after the bridge. Uh, even though that area was supposed to be Chulia, and this is confusing because many of the Malaccans were not necessarily Malay, as I mentioned. They were Jawi Pranakan, right? Nordin, who was a Penang Jawi Pranakan, was the same, Nordin, Nordin Lane, uh, Haji Mohammed Nordin. So, so you see, this is where the race becomes a little bit like, what do you mean Malay, you know? Um, when he said Malays were to move that side. So the Chulias, uh, not Chulias in this case, the Jawi Pranakan from Malacca also moved that, that, to that side. Uh, with those who obeyed at least. Um, now, uh, so that's, that's something about, uh, but the, the point here is that the Malays continued to retain some connection to Singapore River. Unlike the other groups who were asked to move to completely the other side, you know, af affiliated with um, the Sultan at Kampung Lam. So that's another story altogether, right? A completely different uh, zone. Uh, as for, um, well, actually, there's the other thing which I didn't get to mention. And that is beyond Kampung Malaka, just a little bit further in, are uh, Bintan or Bintan, Bintan Island Chinese uh, fishermen. Hmm. They live just upriver. Uh, there used to be a Kramat there, actually. Uh, Kramat Bukit Bintan, sometimes confused as Bukit Bintang. Same thing. Hmm. Bintan Island is sometimes spelled Bintang and then Bulan and Bulang. So is it Bulang and Bulan or Bintan and Bintang? So Bulan and Bintang is moon and star. So that's often opposed to each other, you know, as, as a complementary pair or opposing pair in Malay. So Bulan and Bintang. So what I'm saying is that there is this Bukit Bintang, which was, uh, which was the settlement of Chinese, uh, Bintan Chinese uh, fishermen just mm -hmm. upriver, and, and so many other settlements, Kampung Pukat, Kampung Martin, and so on, just up the river uh, from Kampung Malaka, associated with a diverse group uh, who were uh, traders, mm. as well as fishermen and other, other uh, occupations. Um, Kampung Bengkulu is associated with the cantonment, it seems. Mm -hmm. So the Bengkulen 
Malay and Sepoy groups were brought over by Raffles because Raffles was of course resident there and Singapore was kind of like, like not really he, he was not in, he was not placed in charge of it uh, formally he you know you have the uh, you have Fakwa as the, the person in charge so both of them brought their own people right in the sense so he brought his own men as the military installation so if you look at the uh, uh, Jackson plan then you will see the cantonment is there the dobies because of the cantonment and so on so Initially, the Bengkulen Malay and Sepoy groups, who would have been Hanafi actually, uh, that's the other thing. So the, the transition to the Hanafi community seems to date all the way back to the origin of Kampung Bengkulu as the station of the cantonment. So I think this is what I've just given is a very broad sweep. What I need to do is to really understand the specifics through you know archival accounts. Um, so that has to go back to Singapore Diary and other such sources, which I didn't even touch on today. So, you know, there's also Kampung Penghulu Kesang. I found in the Singapore Diary several entries on this interesting Kampung Penghulu Kesang, way too early for when it finally appeared in our colonial maps. So when it finally appeared in our colonial maps, it's already the 1870s and 1880s. In the Singapore Diary, Penghulu Kesang and his Kampung was mentioned in 1828. And supposedly that was when the government was supposed to acquire his land and compensate him because he had reclaimed the entire area. You know, the entire southern bank of Singapore River was swampy. So Penghulu Kesang, who comes from Mua, uh, and there's a very complicated connection to how uh, there was a power contest between the Sultan of Singapore who, you know, did not own Johor because the Temenggong took Johor and left just Mua and Kesang to him. You know, there's this complicated history, backstory to it. But Penghulu Kesang, uh, was then supposed to have been compensated in 1828, but there you have his name in the colonial maps of 1870s and 1880s. So what does it tell us? You know, was he was the land acquired from him by the colonial government, or was it not? Fifty years later, he appears in the colonial map. So, I mean, there's, what I'm I'm trying to convey through all these random and seemingly very random anecdotes of very obscure place names and so on, and individuals for that matter is that there's so much to Singapore history that we still don't understand. And it really goes far beyond the kinds of um, stories centred on uh, what little we have uh, of accounts written mostly of elite players. right? So less elite or non-elite players, I would consider most of the Malacca Malays actually as non-elite players. Uh, the Bengkulen Malays as well. Right, so or, or semi elite or whatever. But 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 what I'm saying is there's so much more to the story and so much diversity uh, that that I'm only beginning to scratch even from from the archive. So I would like to qualify, you know, that whatever I can say right now about the early, early origins of Kampung Melaka and Kampung Bukulu is probably really just the tip of the iceberg. Mm. It's only what I've seen from building drawings and maps. Yeah. Mm, but yeah, what you're able to to locate right now, and, yes, and, yes. And I guess that's the exciting thing about your research as well. You are constantly on the lookout for for more and more of this of of, of these examples. Yes, yes. Mm. And and we still need to look at the the, the written archives, which is uh, you know completely different thing. It's not digitized, even if it is, it's handwritten. We cannot use, uh, you know, search function. And so you need to invest a huge amount of time to look for a needle in a haystack. You want to look for Kampung Bungulu Kesang? Good luck. He is spelled in 10 different ways. His name, I mean, Kasang, Kisang, Kesang with double S, single S, as we will see with a K. You know, it's really, actually that's the challenge because beyond the big names that we know of, all these little obscure names and so on, they are so difficult to trace. Yeah. I, I find that problem just searching for Kampong alone. Oh, with, yes. with all the different spellings and, yes. and, and, and like uh, what you've connected for us today as well, the connection yes. to, to, to Kampong. Yes. Uh, yeah. but, but what you've talked about, I, I think that's, that's something that uh, if you can see some of the questions that people oh, yes. have, have, have shared, mm -hmm. um, there is a, 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 a huge interest actually in trying to account for how uh, many of these place names have, have changed along the way. I think uh, Jason Kellner, for example, uh, is interested in, in, in why there has been such uh, transitions. Um, and, and, and I think you have alluded to, to some of that in your, in your talk as well. Obviously, uh, when places have been expunged, um, they are gone and, and, and soon we, we forget. Um, but but I, I guess uh, you've, you've also shown us how there have been many uh, changes in, in the names. Um, there were a lot more names associated with the same place uh, in the yes, past as, yes. as compared to now. I mean, do you have some comments or responses to that? Yes, these are all really interesting questions from uh, somebody who is interested in maps, of course, right, and names. Mm -hmm. So um, 
Yeah, uh, let me try and answer everyone. Uh, I mean, try and group the ones that are related. So mm. the first question um, from Jason Kellner, how, interesting how original names have transitioned. Do you know why this has happened? So we can talk about it in terms of um, uh, uh, names uh, by the community. Sometimes people give it the name vernacular names, right? Because of the, the opposition between official and vernacular. Mm. So uh, you have the official names on the streets, uh, street signboards, and then you have the names that everybody knows. So if you look at the colonial sources that do document, ironically, we have to fall back on colonial scholars writing for colonial era jour academic journals to know the vernacular names. Because the vernacular names, again, vernacular quote unquote, like Hokkien, Teochew, and so on, they were not actually written down much. Uh, unless you go to the Chinese registers of street names, which is one, one source, right? Um, but uh, wh why I was getting at is, these are names that the English-speaking uh, colonial public had to use when they spoke to Jinrik Shapulas. Mm. That was the publication's raison d'etre. So its reason for being was, look, if you come to Singapore, you're not going to get to Flint. Uh, you're not going to get to Albert Street if you say Albert Street to the Jinrik Shapula. You've got to tell him Kampong Kampong Mangkulu. Then you are uh, Kampong Mangkulu where? Then you will find because a series of streets were all called Kampong Mangkulu. Um, now, what does this tell us? It tells us that as long as there was a balance of, shall I use the word power? Balance of agency between who could dictate how a place is named, uh, the vernacular name would survive. Once the reason for that usage dwindles or disappears, you would only have the official name. Uh, I want to draw attention to this anecdote that I keep using, the anecdote of uh, Kampung Jawa. Kampung Jawa is confusing. There are so many Kampung Jawas because there are so many Javanese uh, within the so-called Malay population in Singapore. So one of the Kampung Jawas is in fact Arab Street. And I didn't show it, but uh, in Hokkien and Cantonese, it's also called Jawa Kai, mm. Javanese Street. Mm. Um, and uh, Malays call it Kampung Jawa, not Arab Street. And uh, when I gave a talk on this for Kampung Glam area a few years ago, the, uh, during Q&A, a person stood up and said, thank you for clarifying. I've been correcting my mum for years when she told me she's going to Kampung Jawa. I told her, what Kampung Jawa? This is Arab Street. Kampung Jawa is KK Hospital, Kampung Java mm. Road. Right? Java. Mm. Because you, there's another Kampung Jawa. There's so many other Kampung Javas. So, I mean, this is an example where her usage remains at the you know, community level. Mm. Who knows if uh, Hokkien speakers still, still call it Jawa Koi? Who knows? You know, we don't know. But the thing is, it's not going to be there. And there is uh, in the street name. And um, we are all, you and I, learning about Singapore through, this is why I keep emphasizing it, through school. Whatever we know about Singapore is in, in, imbibed through school. We don't learn it from our parents. We don't go and ask our parents, what do you call this? No. Everything we learn about every part of Singapore is historical identity, how people interacted with each other, are all in books and now in our heritage museums, our centres. Mm. That's why it's even more important for us to recover these kinds of diverse histories because otherwise we are replacing a set of understandings that were rich and super you know, complex mm. for something extremely simplified because, I don't know, we choose to compartmentalise it in neat ways when it's completely not neat, it's messy and therefore rich. So I, I think that's, that's a way for me to answer this. Why have they changed? Well, because we, we, we only find out from official narratives now. We don't, we don't speak. I mean, once this is actually a condition of modern education, right? Mm. So let's say I, I want to give an, uh, kind of like, it sounds like a deviation, but people, I mean, my, my, my two uh, sisters uh, and others who have given birth, would you ask your parents how to take care of the kid or, do, uh, or your child? Or do you check the internet? You know, so now there's yet another level of learning. So perhaps that's why I, I spoke about um, maybe digitizing. Uh, you know, there's another way to to kind of um, enrich where we get our sources of information from, mm. because now it has kind of jumped away from even schooling into. Uh, the internet. Mm. But that's precisely why oral histories, oral traditions, and, and uh, these are pre precisely the things that we should be collecting mm. uh, and archiving. Mm -hmm. um, precisely because they don't, uh, if, if not, they don't end up in these, these official records. Yes, yeah. of course. So oral histories, the only sad thing is that um, oral histories today mm. uh, have, will no longer have access. So you've got to look at the older oral histories. I'm not discounting today's oral histories at all, but what I'm saying is today's oral histories, we are limited in our temporal horizon, right? Most people we can interview today, even if they're very elderly, will only know up to a certain period in history. And that's why we get this glorious 1950s nostalgia. 
because everybody who is elderly enough to you know, say I, you can have my oral history because I'm old enough would remember mostly the 1950s as children. So then it becomes like the thing, the go-to thing to think about the past. Not the 1920s, not the 1910s, and definitely not the 1880s. Mm. So, I mean, there's also a limit to... So, thank goodness, there was the Oral History Project of the 18, 1980s, 1984, and so on. Mm. Because at that time, there were some interviewees who were over 100 years old or over 80 years old, right? Mm. So, they remembered uh, instances that, you know, are not in the official uh, colonial archives from the 1880s and the 1890s. Mm. I found that to be particularly rich for Kampung Glam. But before I go on too much... Uh, on that on that track, I want to go to this next few questions that talk about Omar Mosque, uh, Mosque Street, Omar Road. Mm. Why did it disappear? Uh, you know, and so on. So actually, you can find out quite easily. Uh, and I want to encourage all of you to do this. Uh, it's quite easy. Just go to newspaper.sg, type in Omar Road, see what you find. Uh, there are newspaper articles, unless they, you see some of the articles, because they're deemed to be of sensitive nature, they are not, there's no preview online, you have to go down to the National Library, sit down at the portal and read it. Uh, but most of them uh, relating to Omar Road and uh, Omar Mosque, Kampung Malaka, are uh, readable online. So uh, you would get the series of articles where there was an appeal by a member of the Aljunit family to at least retain the name, even though the area around the entire mosque is expunged, going to be demolished. So when it was demolished, uh, you know, the old Ministry of Manpower building, which is still there, uh, was built in an L-shaped formation around, kind of uh, wrapping around partly uh, the, the site of the mosque. And so the assurance given uh, by the then, um, I can't remember the exact de designation, but somebody from the Urban Redevelopment Authority is that, uh, yeah, we will have a pedestrian walk. Uh, that pedestrian walk in this new development called, I can't remember the name, it was not yet, at that time it was not supposed to be for Ministry of Manpower, it was supposed to be for a shopping mall of some sort, given a fancy name. Uh, not, not so fancy, but to me it was a little fancy. But um, maybe you wouldn't think so, but it was an, a commercial development and one pedestrian street, it said, uh, the, the, the representative from URA said, would be called Omar Road, you know, to retain the memory. Uh, what happened in the end was it was given over to Ministry of Manpower. Uh, there was no such uh, concession made to the name. So I hope I've answered the question. I can't remember the exact year, I'm so sorry, because right now I, I can't recall offhand. But that was what happened, in case you were wondering. Uh, so, yeah, maybe, you know, it's always possible now uh, to, 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 to kind of rename uh, places like that. Um, was there a reason why? Yes, I am asking this question myself and I have not found the answer. I'm so sorry. It's going to take a lot more effort to find out why the names were swapped. Maybe it's easy. Once you find, you know, it's like mining, right? Once you hit the right load of information, suddenly it all opens up. But like I said, the, the, two, toponym, uh, the, the two works that deal with street names, uh, that we know of for Singapore. There are many others, um, older, older references that I recall, but I looked at the two major ones. Huh? They did not mention this uh, street name swapping, yeah. um, meaning that it was that difficult to find, that mm. you know, even these comprehensive surveys, they are very comprehensive surveys otherwise, yeah. missed out on such a major... Uh, mm and very mystifying swap. Yeah, you're referring to the Queen Street and Queen Victoria Street and Victoria mm. Street were yeah. originally the other way around. So yeah. what mm. is today the major thoroughfare, the one way, well, it's become two way, but originally one way, uh, that's today called Victoria Street, was originally Queen Street. Mm. Uh, but origi even before that, it was called Marlborough Street in the 1829 survey published in 1836 and 1839. And then um, there was also the 1822 uh, Jackson Plan, which called it Rocho Street. Uh, if I am I recalling, yes, North Bridge Road and Rocho Street. So that Rocho Street would have been what is today's Victoria Street, which was later named Marlborough Street in the survey map of G.D. Coleman, and then uh, Queen, uh, Queen Street before it now mm. becomes Victoria Street. No, so I can't answer why yet. If I've understood you correctly, says Jason Kellner, oh, again, uh, are you saying the row compound houses on Queen Street were basically similar to normal British houses at that time with a front garden, porch, etc.? Mm, quite different because of the, the facade ornamentation which actually follows uh, the, the formal uh, composition uh, of the Singapore uh, shop house of a particular uh, time period. I mean, it is given all sorts of names, but if you looked at the drawings, you will know what I mean. So they follow what is, uh, in one, at one glance, you will be immediately able to identify it as a single product. Uh, because of the nature of the building industry, you know, the, the, the workmen uh, common, had a common kind of, uh, 
unspoken uh, ornamentation repertoire that they stuck to more or less, varied in certain ways, but it's more or less the same all the time. Uh, so that's, that's kind of uh, identifiable in that sense. Uh, morphologically, beyond just styling, right? Uh, that's like a facade thing. Morphologically as well, it's a little bit different, I would say, uh, than the, uh, the, the... Because internally, the divisions were more like the shop house uh, rather than the, um, the, the ones you find, the terrace houses you find in the UK. So in, the internal partitions also uh, matter. And then the, the, um, the way in which uh, the, the building is segmented uh, for air wells and so on is also different from the... So, so there is a case to be made about the fact that the, the shop house is a formative typology which spawned many other variations. And you could say that the compound row house, that's how I've chosen to call this otherwise unlabeled or uncategorized type of build, uh, category of building, um, seems to be a, a kind of shop house modified for a compound, retaining the sense of a compound in front, behind, or collectively, you know, rather than just a shop house has no compound at all, as you know, it's immediately uh, the interior from the five foot way. So this one has a kind of a threshold, series of uh, lengthened thresholds. Um, there's one more question here about... Mm, you can probably answer one last question okay, from great. here. Um, I, I think there was some interest in, in Kampong Susu. Uh, yes, Kampong Susu, yes. Yeah. The, the quick answer, yes. Yeah. Uh, some newspaper reports yeah. tell us this as well, uh, mm. that there were, in fact, yeah. Uh, there was, there was a, uh, definitely... Uh, I mean, it's in reference to the fact that um, there was a dairy industry. So, but the dairy industry is also found elsewhere. I think there was a concentration there and it became famous for that. So it's called Kampong Susu. It is indeed in reference to uh, uh, South Asian groups who, who, who mm. were trading in, uh, in, in dairy products. Mm. And, and I mean, I, I guess that really does uh, bring us to the point that you made earlier as well about how ethnicity is but one way of, of, of identifying um, and, and in turn, one way of, of naming places mm -hmm. as well. You're, you're looking at vocation, you're looking at industry, you're looking at a whole variety of, uh, of, 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 of diversities, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yes. And, and yes. when you look at places like, uh, again, places like Kampong uh, Bengkulu and Kampong Malacca, it's, a, it's really an intersection of all these different identities uh, at play. Yes. Hmm. I, 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 I thought to maybe draw our, <clears throat> to draw our discussion uh, to, to a close as well. I mean, I, I, I um, apologize if, if we haven't been able to answer everything um, that, um, that, um, that our audiences have been asking. Fine, yeah. But um, I, I, I like the, the question that you ask at the end of your talk. Um, where do we go from here, essentially? Mm. How do we, uh, now that we have... Um, uh, started digging deeper and, and discovering this um, um, through, through the micro histories, the, 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 the sheer diversity of, of, of each place, if you're looking at, at, at place histories, yep. uh, but that of Singapore at, at, at large. Mm -hmm. um, how do we put it back together again? <laughs> um, you know, um, and obviously, I mean, one obviously we we've we've moved beyond just talking about one single narrative of of Singapore's history. Mm. There, there are many narratives and many ways of looking at it. Um, but how would you um, how would you as a as a historian um, approach that, or, or or even responding to 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 what we do as 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 museums, um, curating exhibitions? Uh, I mean, that's that's something that's gotten me thinking as well. How does that um, feed back into the way that we tell and, and the way that we present uh, Singapore's history? Yeah, this is a very difficult mm. question and I'm still mm. trying to figure out uh, mm. the so what so mm. to this, right? Like uh, once you know it's diverse, so what? So is that is all? Is, you know, it's about um, glorifying diversity, you know? So I want to also say the flip side of this, right? And that there are indeed frictions and there are indeed people who uh, had the upper hand and people who were disadvantaged in the inevitable competition, right? Mm -hmm. I, can, I can actually insert this word competition that took place for, for example, urban property. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, and uh, that's, that's something that I didn't really develop in this presentation because I wanted to focus on kind of celebrating the diversity, if you like. But definitely the next chapter to talk about is this flip side. The friction, the negotiation, those who lost out, those who gained more, those who exploited, and so on. So when we talk about the Lorong subdivisions, you know, uh, it's quite interesting because 
uh, or rather we can put it another way. If we looked at it as a transactional history of uh, the city, right? So all of these are not just um, architecture, they are also investments for returns. Uh, it would be interesting to, for us to learn that a lot of the investments, uh, quite a disproportionate amount compared to the, the number of uh, this group in Singapore, uh, com in the Singapore community, are uh, actually uh, Malays, Bugis, um, and Arabs particularly, as well as Jews. Uh, why? Because these groups uh, of, the, of, of uh, Islam and Jewish faith, Muslim and Jewish faith, uh, they, you looked upon, um, I'm not saying they, they dominated the scene, they did enough, they dominated enough for certain articles uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century to talk about the dominance of, uh, say, Arab and Bugis landowners, actually. They were singled out in this particular article that I recall uh, for having a very disproportionate control over urban property. Uh, the reason for this is they wanted a way to invest and keep their money that avoided usury. So banks were a no-no at that time for um, these Muslim groups uh, who had a lot of cash in hand from their trade. Uh, of course, they went. Th this was a major mistake for them when the lease, leases uh, expired. So in the Middle Road area, incidentally, uh, a lot of these leases expired in the 1950s. So the, there are also newspaper reports and other articles and reports talking about uh, how a vast majority of the uh, land there returned to the state, yeah. um, the colonial state at that time, the municipality, uh, and also with the uh, Rent Control Act. So, it, 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 so in that sense, there, there are several levels of story that I'm kind of just kind of casually dropping here, which is um, where people stored their wealth, differences in uh, religion and uh, ethnicity and where they stored their wealth, so uh, investment in um, property, right? Uh, urban property to be precise, not, not, not uh, land outside of the core city centre. Uh, and then how they lost out eventually uh, because of the way structural changes deleted that wealth as well. Yeah? Um, the Rent Control Act being one major one. So uh, there's that, but also if you read, uh, for example, Norman Edwards' uh, account of urban history in Singapore, he talks about the push of Malay groups. So there were so many Malay names that, I mean, not as many here, but the, the full list has a lot of Malay names. They were pushed out of the city. So um, towards the um, turn of the century and in the course of the 1920s and 30s, there was an exodus of Malays out of the city until we get to this point in uh, today's scenario where we have the stereotype that Malays never lived in the city. Right? They, they, there's this stereotype. Uh, there are all these uh, um, aspects of urban history that we could also talk about, and not just a rosy picture. So maybe that's, that's one way. To, I mean, I'm jumping the gun here. So if we want to complexify it, the complexity also comes from not just a feel-good, you know, happy story, but also uh, the less salubrious and uh, not so celebratory aspects of um, inter-ethnic, um, I would use the word competition, that did indeed take place besides collaboration, which was also plentiful. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So, so really uh, appreciating the complexity of relationships. Really. Yes, so, yes. So, and, 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 and I like that. I mean, uh, and, and that's something that I think all of us can, can, can take back from, from today's session. You know, I, I think you, we, you, you've shown us the, the importance of digging deeper to begin with, uh, to look at um, uh, places, to look at communities, uh, to look at stories that have otherwise been written out, forgotten, uh, for, for, for various reasons. And, and because of that, um, we can then appreciate the diversity. Uh, but I think uh, from, from what we have discussed here as well, moving on from simply appreciating that diversity, is, it's, it's, uh, perhaps we are moving into slightly uh, uh, more, <laughs> more challenging waters where, where, yes, yes. where, where we, we then confront the, the the complexity of relationships, whether collaboration, whether yes, competition, mm. um, power dynamics, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, many many more chapters of, of Singapore's history in that sense to, yes. to be written. Indeed. Um, yeah. and, and and with that, I, I really thank you, Dr. Imran, again, uh, for for your talk, yep. for for the very uh, engaging discussion. Uh, we look forward to, to how your, your research progresses from here as well. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, National Museum, thank you, uh, Daniel. And uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining me uh, this evening. Yep. Okay. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Thank you so much, Dr. Tajuddin, for that very interesting uh, presentation, and Daniel as well for moderating a, a very uh, fruitful discussion, I think. Uh, thank you, viewers, for tuning in to our first live stream session of Historia SG. So before you go, there's just three things that I want to uh, mention. Firstly, we would really, really appreciate if you help us fill in a feedback form. If you're on Facebook, it should be appearing in the chat. And if you are on the go.gov website, you can find the link in the details tab of the Q&A part. Secondly, um, this is not the end of our live stream sessions of Historia. We will be having the next one on 8 August as a National Day special. And this uh, talk will feature Professor Bernard Tan talking about the development of National Day songs over the years. So stay tuned to our website and Facebook if you are interested to hear more. And lastly, for those who did not have the chance to catch our Historia SG lectures in person last year in 2019, we actually have uh, full pre-recorded versions, not pre-recorded, full recorded versions of these lectures available on our website, nationalmuseum.sg. Uh, so you can go to the programs page under Historia SG and you can watch um, these lectures in the, from the comfort of your own home. So that's all I have for you today. Um, thank you very much for tuning in and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you and good night.